episode number 102 of the Cozy Corner of Cinema. It's being recorded on Friday, March 8th, 2024 at 10.53 a.m. on a slightly chilly yet sunny morning. It's hard to gauge exactly the weather without, one, looking it up, and two, just simply stepping outside. Sometimes it's chilly indoors, and then it's kind of warm outdoors, and... You're like, oh, it's nice in here, but it's going to be nice out there. And then it's like, my gosh, man, it's a scorcher. But you never know. So step outside, breathe in the cool air. Uh, you know, just let the sunshine rain down on you. It's just a beautiful, beautiful day out. Uh, we'll have to go out later to the cinema. So hopefully this is going to be uh, window down weather. Uh, that'd be cool, but I'm not anticipating it. But that'd be a nice change of scenery, man. Because uh, I guess it's technically still winter. I don't know when, when exactly winter and spring kind of start, uh, or any season really starts. They kind of all just converge into one another and sort of blend uh, without any real set uh, due date. You know, the you know the maker out there, he's not watching and going like, oh, it's this day, man, I got to make sure it switch the dial from winter to spring, man. No, it's the elements out there are like, we're doing our own thing. And, uh, you know, that's all right. We just adjust accordingly. We wear clothes accordingly. And we uh, we go about with any kind of uh, circumstances, as long as it's not like a damn, you know, tornado out there. If it's a tornado out there, it's like maybe you don't want to step out there, man, I tell you. And, uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, this Sunday, this in a couple of days from now, we got the uh, Academy Awards. And that's gonna be that's gonna be a lot of fun to. Uh, it's always fun to see what uh, you know what wins and having discussions with acquaintances, uh, agreements, disagreements with um, you know who won, who lost, or oh this person you know I thought should have won this, or oh this person I thought shouldn't have won this, and it's all just in good conversation. And that's what's so great. I mean, I don't hold any of these award shows on any sort of special podium, man. I mean, uh, the, these don't the, these are just merely. A series of votes, you know, whether or not these films will withstand the test of time remains to be seen. However, for that certain moment and in that uh, certain time, you go, this was the film of the moment. Uh, you know, you look at like 1941, what wins Best Picture? You'd think Citizen Kane. I mean, it's one of the greatest films ever. Nope, it's John Ford's How Green Was My Valley, which is also a good film, don't get me wrong, but I think uh, Citizen Kane has definitely had the stronger threshold on pop culture, on cinema, on uh, creating a legacy of Orson Welles, more so than How Green Was My Valley. It's, uh, it's, it is a good film, though, but it's, it, when I think of the strongest uh, John Ford picture, I don't think of uh, How Green Is My Valley. I think of Stagecoach. I think of The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. I think there's all these wonderful films. And I actually bring that up because I'm just about finished. Well, i got about 100 or so pages left, so maybe not quite finished. But I've been finishing up this uh, biography about John Ford. And it's just really great. It's uh, just the, the completely different climate of filmmaking. And sort of just like it's, it's when, when I'm reading it, it's kind of even wild that he even became a filmmaker. Kind of was just sort of thrust into it. And he, just the amount of films he made in just such a short amount of time. And when I say short amount of time, I mean like you do multiples a year, man. And this was, you know, they talk about uh, going into... Uh, the talkies, now a lot of filmmakers weren't able to transition successfully and make uh, quality films, but of course John Ford did, and, and throughout his career he's had many cycles. He's uh, he's like Howard Hawks, these sort of journeyman directors who have uh, just multiple points throughout their career, uh, never really truly dipping in terms of quality where they kind of have a burnout, and I'm not saying that like the final film has to be great, but I'm saying that even a later film of his like the man who shot Liberty Valance is considered to be one of his strongest. And you look at his earlier work, I'm talking about before, Stagecoach, which is, I mean, relatively earlier, so to speak. I mean, he had started a decade previously, but um, either way, he's just a, such a quality filmmaker. And it's just a real, it's just a real, um, uh, uh, what's the one I'm looking for? It's a real arduous task to even try to watch all of his filmography because he has so many films and how many of his earlier works are lost and how many are readily available. It's, you know, it's something that if you're looking forward to doing, you really kind of do your research on, you know. It's sort of like, uh, right now I'm currently working through the filmography of Vittorio De Sica. And there's one of his films that I just I have not been able to find, but I, I did find a DVD of it online, so I will have to uh, purchase that at some point. Um Let's see. Yeah, it was La Porta del Chilo uh, from 1945, which was the film that he did before Shoeshine and after The Children Are Watching Us. And um, I got a couple more of his films done this week. I uh, I don't remember if I... I think I watched Umberto D before the last episodes because I had watched that. I'd never seen it before. Um, but in the past week, I have watched Indiscretion of an American Wife, which was his first American film, I believe, with... 
who the hell's in that? Was that Henry Fonda who was in that film? I don't actually remember. Um, there's also another film called The Discretion of an American Wife um, that I think is from 98. Not Henry Fonda. I'm sorry. It's Montgomery Clift. I don't know what I'm thinking of. I think because I'm actually, Henry Fonda's on the mind, but I'm looking at, when I'm uh, reading, it was John Ford biography. He's been popping up a lot in it. But yeah, it's Montgomery Clift and uh, Jennifer Jones. I'd seen this film previously on TCM, and it hadn't really made much of an impact on me, and I kind of felt the same way uh, on a second viewing. It's not one of my favorite uh, DeSica films, but it is it's a pretty good film. Um, and I did watch The Gold of Naples, which is good as well. I actually like this one quite a bit, uh, and it's just great. You know, I still have quite a number of films I have to get through, because um, the next film to watch is The Roof from 1956, and then this final film is The Voyage in 1974. So, um... There's quite a bit here about, about making good progress. I think I've, I mean, I've liked all of his films that I've seen so far. There's none of them that I thought were outright bad. I mean, I think Indiscretion of an American Wife is probably my least favorite so far, but either way, I mean, his early his early work, I think, is actually very good. I really like his uh, debut, Red Roses, from 1940. Um, I was actually really surprised how much I liked that. And I say surprised, I mean, I shouldn't even say that, but I'm just saying, I uh, you know... A film like that, I wasn't um, expecting to be as high on as I was, and that's definitely one of his stronger ones. But still, I mean, I you know, I'm going through his filmography, and it, I, there's no chance that Bicycle Thieves won't be my favorite of his work. It's just, a, I mean, that last rewatch I did, it was just, it reminded me of just how much I love this film. I, it was truly like, like watching it again for the first time. I, I was just completely. It's just one of those great feelings of just being completely engrossed in a film where you forget where you even are. You know, you're just so engaged with the characters about this guy who's uh, trying to find job and he's uh, having trouble it's uh, you know it's one of these uh situations in italy where they uh you know you have to get up and go to like uh it's not even a job fair it's more just kind of like uh you know you if you have x amount of qualifications you can you're only el- eligible for x amount of jobs um sorry i got coffee here so i apologize for the pauses and uh anyway so yeah it's and he gets a job as a um uh, hanging up flyers around uh the city but he needs a bike for it, and uh, if, and he 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 takes he he takes the job. He he lies. He says he has a bike, but he doesn't. And basically, um, through some circumstances, because it's not a very wealthy area. I mean, there's it's a lot of you can tell there's a lot of poverty there. So it's, any kind of job that uh, he can get is sort of like great, um, at least in the area that he's living in, because he goes out elsewhere to like down to the city and all that. But anyways, I don't want to give away the whole film. But basically, he uh, he does end up getting a bike, and uh, things are looking up for him, and then something unfortunate happens. And uh, you can probably guess by the title, but either way, it's just, it's, I don't, I don't need to champion this film. It's one of just the great Italian uh, neo-realist films. It's, one, it's De Sica's strongest film, to me, undoubtedly. I mean, this is, even, even with everything I've seen so far, Umberto D is... is, is, is uh, often regarded in the conversation as well as one of the strongest, but Umberto D is, is, I mean, right now my three favorites, I don't even really like to do rankings or anything like that, but my favorites right now are um, Bicycle Thieves number one, uh, The Children Are Watching Us at number two, and then Umberto D at number three. The Children Are Watching Us, um, that really just blew me away. That was the first time watching, I was just so emotionally invested in these films in that film. And but Shoe Shine is also great as well. That one's also often talked about in conversation, a uh, big inspiration for filmmakers like uh, Paul Schrader, um, I don't know if Shushan has a criterion or not. I don't. I don't know. I, I, to my knowledge, I, it might just be Bicycle Thieves, Miracle in Milan, and Umberto D. But don't quote me on that because I might be completely wrong about that. Because there are times where I wonder. I go like, oh, is this film have a criterion? And then I look it up, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's great. Like I didn't know um, Only Angels Have Wings from Howard Hawks. Going back to the beginning, that had a criterion. I was like, wow, okay. I, I that was such a great film that I watched on TCM when I discovered that had a criterion. Man, that was just so so cool, man. And, of course, I haven't picked it up yet. Like, it always happens. I always talk about, you know, films. I'm like, oh, that's great. It's getting a, it's getting a Blu-ray. I'm going to pick that up. And I don't pick it up for, like, a year, for years. You know, it's ridiculous, man. Um, I am going to pre-order that uh, Goodbye Uncle Tom 4K, though. I, I'm really, really looking forward to getting that 4K. That's a film I've been championing for, uh, gosh, probably over almost 15 years now. I would say. I think I first saw it in 2011, 2010, maybe 2012, actually. I don't remember. I, I may have, I may have actually watched it the first time in 2011 or 12, um, and I just I think it's just a really incredible film, um, just wild filmmaking um, that has only been on uh, DVD from Blue Underground. Along with those other, um, I mean, it's not a Mondo film, but those other uh, uh, films by um, I always blank on that Jacopetti and uh, the other fellow whose name I'm blanking on. Um, 
I can't remember. I think the 4K as well actually might be including that documentary, The Godfather's Mondo, which also has a DVD. I think that may have been exclusive to that box set that came out that had Mondo Kane 1, one and 2, uh, Africa Audio, um, Goodbye Uncle Tom. Uh, I think that might be it for that box set. But those got individual releases from um, Blue Underground. I was talking to an acquaintance a while ago. This is the crazy part. We were talking about Africa Audio because Africa Audio has two cuts, um, which is the uh, Africa Audio and the Africa Blood and Guts. And there was a discrepancy with the runtime, and I this is a little while ago, and I don't fully remember what the deal was, but the runtimes were, like, completely inaccurate, man. It was, like, online and on the disc. It was, I don't know what it was, man. I'm not even going to try to paraphrase the conversation, but it was something where I, I was like, what the hell is going on here, man? It was so bizarre, and um, I never uh, I never fully understood it, but I also don't remember the, fully remember the conversation, so I can't really comment on that, but... Have some more coffee here. We're starting to warm up, which is great. Got uh, warm coffee. Well, warm to hot coffee and cool to medium water here. Because like I say in the morning, the first thing you want to do is get coffee or tea. But no, that's not true, man. You want to get water first because, you know, you're sleeping overnight. And you got to wake up. You got to get yourself hydrated, man. Got to eat something too, you know. I tell you, I have some sip of this delicious water right here. Especially if you have a couple of pints the night before. The uh, uh, alcohol takes water out of your body, so when you wake up in the morning and you feel so dehydrated, that's why, man, it's being drinking. So you want to get yourself a, uh, a nice beverage, a nice cold beverage of water. Um, anyways, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Sort of rambling on yet again. Yeah, so I hope you guys have been, uh, enjoyed the first episode of Peephole Pictures. That was something I've been wanting to do for a little while, um, is discussing uh, and reviewing adult films, but it was sort of a work in progress sort of deal, and the opportunity, uh, arose itself, and, uh, I, I put that episode out, and I was, I was fortunate to see that it's been getting, uh, quite, uh, a lot of views, I got a couple, uh, you know, some good feedback on there, so that was really cool, man, yeah, I was talking about the Daisy May and Formal Fawcett, um, uh, Picarama Blu-ray, and uh, there's others I definitely want to do, not just uh, Blu-ray and DVD releases, but I also want to review the films as well, uh, just on their own merit, and, and kind of highlight some of these films that may not be in the general kind of conversation, because, um, you know, I, I was, I, I abandoned, I, I stopped doing the list episodes, because it was becoming a, it was becoming an interference with my actual work that I needed to get done, because recently I, I've been working, I've been knee-deep in a writing project for months now, and I had to, uh, I had to re-watch a couple of films, and make notes, and, and, uh, you know, for the context of this writing, and I knew that with 1941, there was just no way that I was going to be able to watch the amount of films that I, I needed to watch, and properly sit down, because with those list episodes, sometimes I do re-watch them, and take notes to, uh, you know, um, you know what I'm doing, um, and and because I, when I first started doing, it, I was going off memory, and that was a terrible idea because especially in the 1958, um, uh, which one did I do first? Yeah, the 1958 episode. I uh, that that was all from memory. I, I just I don't, that was that was a little embarrassing to even try to talk about these films and remember them. I just don't think that was my strongest uh, sort of um, criticism of any of those films. Um, it just it just wasn't the best. So. I mean, for the sake of timing, I just, you know, doing these episodes, the list episodes, time is just not on my side in that regard. And same with the Blu-ray episodes, I, I, I try to watch these films, you know, films I think of note in conversation, but time, which is not on my side, I'm just, I'm too focused on this. So at least with the uh, peephole pictures, I, I don't really have a set schedule, I kind of just uh, release these whenever I feel. And also, they're fairly, um, you know, they're, they're not the, I don't even want to say low effort, but, I mean, in a case like this, because there are no features, I'm essentially just reviewing the films and then talking about it briefly, so if I do want to go more in-depth on on a title and or on a release I, I should say and um look at all the features and all that uh that'll give me the opportunity to not be bogged down but by, by a deadline uh in terms of you know we all have like, our own deadlines you know there's like you know i want to do i need to do x amount of writing uh a day i need to do x amount of watching a week i need to you know this and that uh i need to do x amount of reading a day and uh you know we all have our deadlines but it's also at the same time it's like if i don't need it, it, it you know the reading uh, uh watching and writing these are my this is my life man this is what i'm doing this is what i've devoted my life to so it's sort of like in a case like this if i don't need to um put that extraneous um sort of stress on myself then i'm not gonna do it man it's just not gonna happen um that's not to say I won't ever return to it, but I just have no intention right now to return to it. It's just, it's just not in the, uh, in the roll decks of life. It's not going to happen. And this is coffee getting warmer. Hmm. There we go. You can always taste different types of coffee too. Between the, uh, Keurig pods and the potted coffee. I prefer the potted coffee. The potted, P-O-T, coffee than, uh, Keurig. 
uh, K cups, but you know, like it's all in the eye of the beholder, and we all have different tastes and all that, and like literal tastes, you know, where our senses. Um, you go to like a fancy coffee shop, and they're gonna have all sorts of um, you know, different uh, ways of doing it, and it's just uh, it's just great, you know, you get to try different uh, ways of of beverages, of foods, and everything like that. Just getting people's distinct styles that they consider, you know, their own or or anything like that. It's just it's just totally great to kind of go outside your uh, normal sort of. Um, you know, uh, uh, periphery of what you would eat and drink and, and try something else. It's just, you know, and, and get a, get a refined palate, you know, it's just, it's just really wonderful like that. But anyways, let's talk about some films, man. Uh, we got to check on the time right here because when I get messages, it doesn't show me the time. So I got to open up the telephone and I did actually remember to silence my telephone. So that's great. I always remember to silence my telephone at the cinema. That's, that's like a, I don't even have to think twice about that. That's almost like an autopilot, but here I, I, often forget to, but I don't know if it actually comes through or not, so it might just be me, or maybe you hear in the background, but I know you probably do hear this damn squeaking chair. I really should get a new chair, but I haven't, and I, I don't think I will. At least not until this one breaks. All right, I've got a couple films here. Okay, now, what I was talking about last week, I was talking about contemporary Hollywood films, or contemporary films, I should say, and it's kind of... Not exactly in the theme again, but this is a more uh, sort of somewhat contemporary film. I would say contemporary-ish. In the 21st century, we have a film from 2001. I didn't know anything about... Except, and this is a big film. This is by no means obscurity, so I'm not even going to try to pretend like, oh, this is a film you, you, you never have heard of. You probably you probably know this film, but I had never seen it. I had heard about it on a podcast. Um, I forgot who was talking about it, but they were... I don't remember exactly what they were even saying. So I had this film come up on... Um, on MGM Plus, which is great, because on Sling you can record, I mean, when you're, if you have Sling, man, take a look at those channels, there's so many cool channels on there, um, because I have all my TCM stuff on there, I have all my MGM Plus stuff there, that's just totally great, but we got Cameron Crowe's, ah, Cameron Crowe's 2001 film, uh, a remake of the Spanish film, Open Your Eyes, uh, this film is Vanilla Sky, stars, uh, quite a cast, you have Tom Cruise, Penelope, Penelope Cruz, there you go, that's a mouthful right there, Cameron Diaz, Kurt Russell, Jason Lee, Tilda Swinton, Timothy Spall, Michael Shannon, uh, Johnny Galecki, Alicia Witt in a small role, it's just a hell of a cast, man. And I'm watching this film, and I know that it's not exactly what it seems, but I don't know exactly what it's doing, because you know, when, when, when the film first starts off, it's interesting, because I'm expecting something far more traditional and romantic, uh, I would say. When I say traditional, I mean in terms of not quite the swings that the film would take. Because the film starts off, and we have a gnarly dream sequence where Tom Cruise is in the middle of Times Square all by himself. And immediately I'm like, this, this, there, this, this, there's, they actually had to have done this, man. There's no way they could have even green screened this. This, this is, this looks way too clean. And then I go online and I look, they actually, in an unprecedented uh, move, they were actually able to shut down Times Square for, I think, a day or so to film this. And I'm just like, wow, man. And, um, I'm thinking about like 28 days later when they had Killian Murphy going out there in the streets of London. They really had him go out there and they were, they were able to shut down traffic only for a little bit at a time that there's a documentary um side by side which i'd highly recommend i've seen that two or three times now and it's a really really excellent look about the evolution of film into digital and the pros and cons of both and there's just a lot of a lot of great um, interviews in there they talk to a lot of filmmakers who have uh, who are who prefer to shoot on film uh who prefer to shoot on digital cinematographers um you know i know like roger deakins who's uh just one of the great um cinematographers he's somebody who's who's very pro digital he, he makes them a lot easier but then you have tarantino who's more of a traditionalist and he prefers film, so, you know, it's, it's different types of formats. Anyways, what I'm talking about here is that with a film like this, so you got Tom Cruise, man, he's playing David Ames. And uh, he's, a, he's a son of uh, this, he, his father is gone, he's a, I don't remember what exactly he even did. He, oh yeah, that's right, he was, the, he was a magazine publisher, he's a, he's a playboy, he's, uh, you know, hooking up with girls, he's got his best friend, Jason Lee, my name is Earl. And of course, the Kevin Smith stuff. And life is good, man, life is really good for him. Um... And then he meets this chick. Oh, okay, but here's here's right off the bat. Now, what I thought was kind of peculiar is that he's in he's in therapy with this guy uh, McCabe, Kurt Russell. And what's bizarre is that he's wearing David's wearing this crazy ass looking mask, 
it's like, and I say crazy, I mean, it, it looks like, uh, you guys ever see Eyes Without a Face? It's like that. It's like, it's like a molding kind of mask. I'm like, what the hell are we doing with this, man? This ain't the kind of film I was expecting it to be, but I was like, that's all right. And I don't say that as a turnoff. I just didn't expect that. I'm thinking like, all right, that's cool. And then where it goes through, and I almost don't even really want to say a whole lot about it. I think I'll just talk primarily about the first half and maybe dab a little bit into the second half. Because I think watching this film uh, the way I did it, it's probably going to be the strongest. So I'll try to uh, keep that intact as much as I can here. And speaking of keeping intact, some more coffee. Mm. I'll probably do a super cut of all times to talk about coffee and drinking coffee. Anyway, so, life's good, man, but it's this chick Penelope Cruz. This chick Sophia. She's a total, I mean, she's smoking. She's a good-looking babe. A good-looking girl. I shouldn't say babe. She's a good-looking lady. Uh, things are looking good. This girl, Julie uh, Cameron Diaz, she's like, she's she's a little unhinged, man, to say the least. And, uh, well, she's like, you know what, man? If you're gonna If you're going to cheat on me with this chick... I'm going, we're going out in the blaze of glory, man. And Tom Cruise is like, man, I don't like that at all. So she goes right off the road, 80 miles an hour in a gnarly car crash, man. I mean, the way they filmed this was so well done. And then there's just silence and you're like, my God, what is happening here, man? Um, David wakes up and his face is all deformed. I mean, he's still Tom Cruise. He still looks like, I mean, he's, he's still a good looking guy, but for a guy who's the face of this company, who's going out there to pick up girls. Now he's got a deformed face. It's like, it's all crazy. I mean, still a good-looking guy. It's Tom Cruise. I mean, come on, man. But, uh, but uh, from there, it's almost like I, I, that's kind of really, really where I want to end it because where I'm watching this film, and then there are there are times where the dialogue is so bizarre. There are just some strange, strange lines in this film. So there's a line that that they say multiple times. Sophia, what the hell does she say? She's like, "We'll meet again in the next life when we're cats." I'm like, what the hell kind of dialogue is this, man? What's going on here? And, and it's got such a strange tone at first. And it's sort of like, is this playing for comedy? Is this playing for drama? Ju- uh, Cameron Diaz is in the car with Tom Cruise. He, she talks. She just says a line there that I won't repeat because it's inappropriate. And I'm like, what? what? Is this a comedic moment? What are we doing here, man? Um, but then where it goes to is kind of just, it kind of matches that bizarre uh, tone in a way at times because it goes into something just completely on its head where the second half of this film almost becomes something completely different. And I don't have, I have no idea how this film was marketed. I don't know if this was marketed in this way, but as I'm watching it, I'm completely on board with this. There's one point in the middle where I was like, is this the film man where this is going to be the wrap up? And you know, this is going to be like, well, what are we doing here? But then I, I thought that was the wrap up. And then that's only like the beginning of the second half and I'm like oh my gosh what are we doing now and it becomes into something far bigger and I don't know how well seen this film is I think it's known um, because the poster of this film gives no indication it's a very generic poster it's just Tom Cruise man he's just looking what is he looking at I don't know he's probably looking at Penelope Cruise um, you don't really get a sense of it you're like what is this film Vanilla Sky what the hell does that even mean and they explain what that means but it goes so uh, bizarre, and it goes into this hallucinogenic, um, really kind of, uh, I don't even want to say quite ethereal, because that's not even exactly the word I want to use, but this otherworldly sort of place that I, I was totally on board for, man. I was like, wow, what are we doing here now? Because the swings that they take, and I should say, I haven't seen the original film, but um, Penelope Cruz plays the same role in that film as Sophia, so I'd be interested to compare... Um, not not the quality of the film, but more so what they chose to um, take from that film and what they chose to uh, leave behind. Because um, and apparently the director of the original film I, I read on IMDb that apparently he really loved the remake, so that, that was really cool, man. That's uh, cool that he was so on board with it. Um, I wish that IMDb would list who actually wrote the film and, and who act and and and, and uh, the writer from the previous film that this was adapted from. Um, uh, I can't, I can't find whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it, uh, and, and also as well, I think the editing of the film was really unique too. Um, it's great because I love in Tom Cruise's apartment, he has giant posters of uh, uh, Godard's Breathless and Truffaut's um, Jules and Jim. And I mean, those are great on its own, but then they do something at the end with uh, Jules and Jim. There's a piece of music that plays, which I've said before on the show is my favorite piece of film music ever it's, it's to me like, there's it's never which is it's strange to say especially for music which is so which is always changing and different um 
pieces of music uh, will affect your your life, you know. But this one piece of music, um, I've I've been it's been my, been my favorite piece of music for uh, for as long since I've seen the film, uh, uh, fifteen plus years ago. Um, but they they do they have this piece of music playing over this montage sequence, and then they have a clip from Jules and Jim, and I swear to you, um, the the hairs on my arms stood when they had that. I was like, wow, this whoever was can't, whoever was was making all this come together, man, they they did a brilliant job on that. And you know what? Let's actually give credit to the editor on this because I don't want to just make it a nameless face. Um, uh, I should also say as well that Cameron Crowe is the sole screenwriter on this. The two other writing credits were from the previous films, like Alejandro Amenabar and Matteo Gill. And the editor on this film is John Hutching and Mark Livolsi. I'm sorry, Joe Hutching. I can't read today. I can't even, I mean, I can't ever read, man. I always get these damn names wrong. So to those two gentlemen, Joe and Mark, wonderful job. Not that they're listening to this, but, you know, more so you know, to get the recognition they deserve. But, I mean, the only problem I would say really is that, I mean, the tone is a little iffy at times in the first half, and I will say a problem I, a problem I do have in the second half as well is a little bit too... I would have liked a little more ambiguity with the ending of the film. I, it does kind of suffer a little bit from explaining the film and explaining what's going on to the point where certain connections I was making, apparently I was incorrect on because the film just explains what's going on and, and I don't, I didn't really like that. I thought that uh, it probably could use a little bit more um, kind of ambiguity on that front. But then the actual very end of the film, I was like, wow, that was great, man. The, the soundtrack in this film was great too. You got like Radiohead and um, Paul McCartney, uh, the Beach Boys. Um, I think Paul McCartney actually got nominated for Best Original Song on this film and Bob Dylan as well. It's a great soundtrack. It's a film that uses that uses big artists and big songs um, very well uh, in, in a way that it doesn't feel like it actually feels like there's some sort of um, um, well I'm trying to think of the word I'll have a sip of coffee here there's um, actually some sort of like uh, conscious kind of programming like the beginning of this film when I was talking about before which is so interesting is that the film in the morning you know when, when uh, Tom Cruise is getting ready for his job and all that and he's He's like, you know, put on his clothes together. We see his extravagant house. They're playing a, a Radiohead song, and it's so interesting that they chose this song to play because it's um, it looks like an electronic kind of sound. It's um, the song is everything in its right place. Um, and if you hear if you hear that song, it's it's a very strange kind of sound. And the way they they decided to use that to open up the film, I thought was such an interesting choice because even right off the bat, I was like, it's not traditionally a song you would use for something almost as um. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Almost as sort of pedantic to, you know, just the character getting ready. You could have played anything. You could have played, like, uh, well, maybe not anything. You don't want to be playing, like, you know, a dude with a guitar solo. Like, you know, <laughs> you don't want to play, like, damn uh, Steve I, you know. Even this dude's getting ready. Probably something more re like, traditional and regular. But, so that's an indicator right off the bat. But, I mean, the film is not going to work for everybody. I think because of the swings that it's taking, it, it's, it's taking risks in that regard where, um, I, but I think that's in part why I liked it so much is because a big studio film like this, when you have a big, a big Hollywood budget, a big Hollywood cast, I mean, and it's doing these really big kind of risks, I thought was so cool. You know, I, I really liked, I, I liked Tom Cruise in this early 2000s period, um, making these really interesting big studio films like this and Minority Report as well is very good. Um, and, um, actually I just about finished this coffee and... Gotta keep an eye on the time. I got a little bit of time left, but yeah, man, I I really liked it. I mean, it, this is one of my favorite things, my favorite discoveries I've seen this this year, man. I really was not expecting to get as wrapped up in the film as I did, especially because there, there is a point in the middle where, where like I was saying before, I was kind of like, man, what are we doing here? Um, but overall, the fact that I was just so engaged by it, engrossed, I was just like, wow, this is a total surprise. And I think that um, the film is known, but I don't. I question how how seen it actually is. So give it a shot, man. I don't know. I mean, I imagine it's probably easily accessible. I, I got to record this off MGM Plus. So if you have Sling and you have MGM Plus, keep an eye on that. But that's that's gonna be it for this episode, guys. Uh, it's a beautiful day out. The sun is shining. The cats are running around in here. It, it's just so great. Life is so beautiful, man. We're just so blessed to be here. And um, you know, it's the weekend, man. If you're not working, make sure you're using your time wisely. If you are working, uh, you know, just hey, man enjoy every second of your day man if you're sitting there like oh, i wish this day was over brother you do not the times the times flying by like speed racer 
you got to cherish every moment of every day and just really kind of count our everyday blessings, man. It's a beautiful life to live, and, and you know, we should all feel so blessed to be here. All right, that's all I got, guys. Uh, adios. Until next time.